Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling Podcast. For countless parents, the journey to unschooling has redefined childhood and transformed their family relationships. Are you curious? Together, let's explore what living and learning looks like without school. Hi, everyone. So a few weeks ago, I happened to notice that the first episode of the podcast went live on January 10th, 2016. And that makes Exploring Unschooling five years old this week. And that seems like a milestone worth marking. And how to do that? Definitely by digging into this rich treasure trove of unschooling stories and highlighting a few of the many beautiful nuggets of wisdom the guests have shared over these five years. It's been such a treat to revisit episodes as I gathered and organized this lovely collection, and I ended up with four distinct sections. Parenting, seeing learning in action, making our world bigger, and the ubiquitous question of college. I imagine it surprises no one at this point that the flow of these sections aligns pretty closely with our unschooling journey. Because that's my jam. So let's get started. First up, let's look at parenting. Once we have kids, parenting becomes one of the jobs on our plate and we want to be good at it. That makes sense, right? But I love how in episode 29, Meredith Novak turns the idea of seeing parenting as a job on its head. Yeah, that, you know, it's, it's funny because that's, that's something that gets said a lot about how parenting is a job and, and it's only really recently that I thought, you know, that's, that's not a very good metaphor. Um, because the idea that parenting is a job kind of goes hand in hand with the idea that parenting is about teaching. You know, it's, it's our job to mm-hmm. teach our kids what's right in the world. And, and those are the ideas that, that distract us from our kids' you know, personhood, I guess you could say. Um, unschooling reconceptualizes the whole parent-child relationship as a relationship first and foremost. Um, and, and that changes so many things. I mean, imagine just for a second, if you were to describe having a baby in terms of getting a new best friend as opposed to like starting a new job. You know, mm-hmm. how does that change your whole attitude about this other person? You know, and naturally you want to do right by your new best friend. Right? You want to be a good friend. You want this friendship to be a strong and healthy one that you can value your whole life long, even knowing that people grow and change and that different people bring different things to relationships. Right. That all feels really, really different than you know trying to figure out how many diaper changes until your new employee will be ready to take out the trash without supervision. Bam. That job like focus encourages us to look at things like productivity and to get to the next milestone as quickly as possible, because our kids are a reflection of us and how good we are at parenting. Right. That's certainly the conventional way of looking at it. That image of trying to figure out how many diaper changes until your new employee will be ready to take out the trash without supervision is so powerful to me. When you put it that way, it seems crystal clear that our children are not our employees. Instead, we can bring our relationship with our child to the forefront. We can focus on cultivating a strong and healthy relationship that lasts a lifetime. If this is where you are on your journey and you'd like to dive deeper, check out the book, The Gardener and the Carpenter, What the New Science of Child Development Tells Us About the Relationship Between Parents and Children by Alison Gopnik. And you can listen to Emma Marie Ford and I talk about the book in detail in episode 81. It doesn't even mention unschooling specifically, but it beautifully explains the challenges of approaching parenting as a job, aka the carpenter. Carpenter parents are working with a goal of producing a particular kind of adult. They are essentially trying to shape their child into a final product that fits with the vision they had in mind to begin with. So for them, parenting is about control. On the other hand, when we garden, we create a protected and nurturing space for plants to flourish. 
She explains that a good garden is constantly changing as it adapts to the changing circumstances. And a good gardener works to create fertile soil that can sustain a whole ecosystem of different plants with different strengths and beauties and with different weaknesses and difficulties too. In this way, being a good parent won't transform children into smart or happy or successful adults, but it can help create a new generation that is robust and adaptable and resilient, better able to deal with the inevitable and unpredictable changes that face them in the future. Unschooling won't thrive if we are trying to mold and control our children to create a final product. In other words, if we see parenting as a job. Rather, we focus on the relationship, on connecting with our kids. This way, we see how they are growing and changing, and we can adapt to better support them along the way. Be the gardener. And what happens when we stop trying to control our children so much? Jessica Hughes and her husband decided to give it six months and to start slowly saying yes more. Because control is all about saying no, right? So what happened when they started saying yes more? She shared this beautiful nugget in episode 136. And at the end of those six months, I mean, really probably six weeks in, the difference was already so incredible. Like we could never have turned back after that. We were so much closer to the kids already and they were so much happier and calmer. They weren't stressed they weren't like little adults who, you know, were worried about paying the bills. And that's what they were like. Before. And I, I didn't, I mean, not that they were really worried about paying the bills, but you know, you see like no, adults no, yeah. who stress about yeah. these big life things and they weren't like that. Anymore. Oh my gosh. They weren't like little adults who were worried about paying the bills. Yes, we've all seen children who are worried about getting in trouble or are sad that they can't do the thing they really want to do, who are stressed because they don't know when a parent is going to come up and insist they do something. It's that same uncertainty that many adults carry, which we can see in their demeanor. Without that weight of uncertainty and lack of agency over their lives, they were so much happier and calmer. They weren't stressed anymore. Now, what might that saying yes more look like in action? In episode 27, Teresa Graham Brett shares such a clear and beautiful example of this transition away from control and toward freedom and connection, and it has to do with rules. We put rules in place to keep our kids safe, to define our and their comfort zone. But does that really work the way we think? Let's listen to Teresa's story. When Martel was very young, um, I decided, well, we're going to let him watch PBS Kids. <laughs> That's what he yeah. has to watch. <laughs> because, of course, it's educational and it's nonviolent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? And so I'm going to give you free access at any time to PBS Kids. <laughs> And if you're going to go on the internet, you get to go on the PBS Kids website and play yeah. those games because they're all educational. Um, so that was really, uh, that's where I started. Um, and, uh, you know, and then as he got older, we would branch out and, you know, oh, what was safe? Oh, let me watch this movie and make sure it's safe. And then, mm -hmm. okay, you can watch the safe. It's safe now, but let me fast forward, you know, past the parts that I don't, I think, um, are going to be too scary for you. Um, yeah. so this was my process was to do all of those things to determine what was within his comfort zone. And I'll tell you after the video incident where I got to watch myself, um, being, you know, recorded interacting with him and we, and I decided that's it, things have to change. I remember Martel, of course, he was fond of Elmo because he could watch Sesame Street, but he would watch this one. There's this one PBS show called Caillou. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you know Caillou? Yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so every time Caillou would come on, there would be a point in almost every episode where Martel would say, shut it off. And so I shut off the TV. Well, I never thought about that when I was still in the sort of dominant mode of everything on PBS kids is fine because it's not my version of violence. And what I realized, I started doing Pam, what exactly what you talked about, like really 
watching TV with him. This is the thing about control. When I controlled his access to everything, food, media, whatever it was, I was uninvolved because I had deemed everything he had access to to be safe. So there was no Mm -hmm. partnership. So he would watch stuff, but I would not watch with him. That was, in some ways, if I think about that control responsibility dynamic that we talked about earlier, like I had abdicated my my responsibility, abdicated my responsibility because I had controlled the environment. And so what I did was when I started to just dive in and say, I'm not controlling anything, I started watching with him. I observed him exactly what you just said. I started really paying attention to who is he, not my version of who he is, but who is he really? And what I noticed in that show, Caillou, is that whenever the Caillou always, quote unquote, gets in trouble at some point in the show, which I'd never Mm -hmm. paid attention to. And then when he starts to get in trouble, a parent um, then chides him. Or somehow, you know, the parent or the teacher is stepping in to correct Caillou. Every point when that started to happen, when he was watching that show, he shut it off. He wanted me to shut it off because Mm -hmm. he couldn't watch that sort of maybe emotional violence being imparted on the child. So it was fascinating to me that his self-regulation was occurring. And the violence that I thought was violence, because of course, I was perpetuating that violence on him, (laughs) the emotional Mm -hmm. violence of control, he already saw it. And that blew my mind. Blew my mind, Pam. Uh I was like, wow, what did I refuse to see before that I can now see? So my conceptions about what I thought were safe were so different. They met this narrative, this societal expectation. But what he needed was for children to be emotionally and, phys- of course, physically, um, but free and safe. And so the violence mm-hmm. he saw was not the violence I saw. So that, if I could talk, point to one thing that so expanded my view of media access, that was it. Yeah, I love, love, love that piece where, you know, you think you're being a great parent by controlling their access. But what it does is those rules, you rely, you, you end up relying on those rules so much, you just, you know, leave them on their own to do everything. You stay within these rules, you're safe. Yeah. And I'm a, and I'm a good parent. Yeah. And, and that's it, right? Yeah. Yet, and then if inside our comfort zone, our child gets upset or whatever, um, conventionally, they're ashamed for that. It's like, you know, why? Don't don't worry about that. That's okay. You shouldn't be scared about that. You know, they, uh, they get it. They get it on both sides, don't they? (laughs) Oh, it's so true. It's so very true. I just started watching so many things with him. You know, we'd watch Teen Titans or, you know, I, at one point, oh my gosh, we were on this marathon family guy. And if any of you have watched Family Guy for a, mm-hmm. so, for a social justice person, it was so <laughs> challenging for me to watch Family Guy because they are offensive and derogatory toward every group. <laughs> and uh, right. And so, but it was so fascinating because I saw the shows he would watch. Like they were like, when youth were empowered like he loved teen titans because the teens save the world every time Mm -hmm. every every show they do something to save the world and then as he got older and we were exploring family guy you know he would ask me and i'd be sitting there uncomfortable thinking he's learning all these stereotypes he's learning all these things oh my goodness oh my goodness and you know he didn't (laughs) <laughs> he didn't pick those things up. Does he in does he internalize stereotypes? We all do. Of course, there was a degree to which that happened. But we could critically talk, we could talk about it. Oh, what did you think of that? What are you seeing? Not in a way for me to manipulate him to believe what I believe, but as a way to understand his experience with that media and that show or that video game, like to just be in it with him changed how I saw his world <clears throat> and opened it up. And then it paved the way for me to do it with Grayson. I talk a lot about mm-hmm. Martel because Martel was the first. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he sort of helped me through it. That's a brilliant insight, right? It gave me goosebumps when we were talking and every time I've read it since. 
When I controlled his access to everything, food, media, whatever it was, I was uninvolved because I had deemed everything he had access to to be safe. So there was no partnership. No partnership, no connection, no observing and adapting the environment so it works better for him. After choosing to drop the rules, the control, and instead join him as he watched what he was interested in, what he was capable of blew her mind. As she said, to just be in it with him changed how I saw his world and opened it up. Being with him opened up his world. And remember that bit for later. The challenge that often bubbles up now is how much time it takes to be with our kids, watching shows with them, playing games, hanging out. And if we aren't using rules and control, it can take longer to move through challenges. But that's a choice too. How do you want to invest your time and energy as a parent? Jan Fortune shared this insight in episode 111. I can remember one day somebody saying to me after I'd spent a long time with one of my children um, negotiating a decision that they needed to make. And they said, well, why did you spend all that time? You could have just imposed, you know, you could have just solved that in five minutes, told them this is what you're going to do, get on with it. And I said, well, and when you do that with your children, um, what happens? Well, they might have a tantrum. They might, and so, so you pour your emotional energy into an hour of a child being hurt and upset and feeling dismissed. And you think that it's a bad idea for me to pour my energy into an hour of everybody winning. It's like, you're going to use the energy. Why not use it creatively? Um, instead of destructively, all parenting takes a lot of energy. And I think if you agree with your children together to use that well, you, you know, you, I think the benefits are fantastic. Absolutely. The benefits are fantastic. We learn more about each other. They feel seen and heard. Our trust in each other grows. We are more connected after, not less. And when it comes to the fantastic benefits of choosing to use our time to support our children, that happens even when our children aren't struggling with something. I just love how Ali Walker explained very important sitting in episode 257. Yeah, you know, this is another thing I've stolen from the private world. <laughs> but, um, you know, that kind of just that being, that that art of the stillness of being together. And um, I think you can find a lot of people who work with wild animals are very good at kind of at least faking that, like, deep inner calm. That kind of where, you know, you don't want to be moving a lot. You don't want to be doing too much. You want to be quite still and just present and aware of what's going on around you. And when we are weaning baboons into a troop, (laughs) um, what happens is they start to go for almost like day visits where they go off your body and they go start playing and they're excited to be in the group with other babies. And then what happens is the second you stand up, or move to even like shifting into a standing position. They're like, what? And they run back to you and jump back on you. Like, where are you going? You know, it's that tether, that anchor to each other. And um, so it, it was really funny to me, you know, cause it just, it interrupts their flow. It interrupts their play. And um, with, I did that a bit with Lila where I realized that just sitting, just sitting and being, in her space and in a kind of designated spot so that she could just kind of orbit around me and do things. I did a bit with her, but with Hazel, it was very clear to me. Like I could just see, it was like, it was that baboon. It was the same exact behavior of you. I need you to be in this spot on the couch. So I know that you're here, no more running about. And I'm going to play with my toys or do whatever I need to do. And I just need you to be here. And I, so I kind of intuitively knew that that's what she was doing because I've spent a lot of time with looking at nonverbal communication, you know, and so I knew that's what she was looking for. But I started calling it my very important sitting time because it was a way for me to kind of signal to myself that what I was doing was very important. And it's so easy to be just internalizing this, like, um, being lazy by sitting here and just like, reading a book or knitting or doing something 
instead of, you know, there's dishes in the sink, there's laundry to be done, dinner's not finished, all of these things that somehow feel like they're more important, but aren't really, you know, <laughs> and so by calling it my uh, very important sitting, you know, it's time, time to go do some very important sitting, usually right around dinner time and in the evenings are two pretty guaranteed very important sitting times. Um, and so I started calling it that because it gave me permission to just let go of all of the other things and go, this is what's important right now. And so I was very intentionally and vocally calling it that. Yes. <laughs> so I never know that. And then I also helped Glenn, I think, because it was his way to, sign he calls it that, you know, he's like, oh, I think it might be time for some very important sitting. Um, it was his way to signal to me, this is okay, what you're doing, I, I also agree that it's important what you're doing right now. And so it's just kind of almost like a little uh, signal to each other between us that like, this is where I'm needed right now. And this is the most important thing I can be doing right now. And so that was how the kind of the phrase came about was so that I would feel like um, I've given myself permission that this is this is the space that my children need me in right now. If it helps, I give you permission to set aside your to-do list for a while and do some very important sitting with your child. I wouldn't be surprised if, when you start looking at your child through this lens, you discover that it's something they would deeply appreciate, your quiet company. Okay, now let's throw a sibling or two into the mix. <laughs> Pam Sarushian was on the podcast way back in episode two, and with three daughters, she shared a plethora of solid insights and ideas about navigating sibling conflicts. Looking back now, how I think I could have done better, and that is, you know, to, to um, just pay attention really closely and head things off when you see frustrations starting at the very, very beginning. Try to offer more, because frustration often comes from a scarcity of some kind of resource, you know, both of them want the same stuffed animal or both of them want the same piece of fabric or they both want to play the piano or one wants to play the piano while the other one wants to watch TV right next to it. Or, you know, a lot of times uh, conflicts arise from that kind of um, wanting something that conflicts with what somebody else wants. And so trying to mm -hmm. offer more right away before they dig in their heels and they're already engaged in some sort of standoff, you know, so if you see a kid eyeing the piano and another kid's watching TV, you know, before they open the piano and start playing it and start having a fight over who's going to get to, you know, have that space, head that off really fast. And that requires paying really close attention um, and being pretty in tune with your own kids so that you sense what's going on before it really sort of breaks out. And so that's the biggest thing to do. And then the other one is sometimes as they get older to stay out of it, you know, especially not with little kids, but with much older kids is to let them use the skills they've developed and figure out how to work it out, you know, while you're kind of paying attention and, you know, making sure they are. Um, yeah, I got too involved, I think, as they got older, I stayed too involved. Yeah. And I think they were, they would have been better off if I let them work things out a little bit more. But then, you know, you never know who, who's listening. I don't know who's listening. Some people are, they stay out of it too much. And they just have this attitude of, you know, let the kids work it out and they need the advice to get involved a little more and a little earlier and other people are too involved. And, you know, for me, it was a, it was a changing process over all those years. And my, mm -hmm. my three daughters are still extremely close. They are definitely each other's best friends and um, hang around together almost every single day. They talk to each other constantly and they still fight. And yep. <laughs> I now at this point need to stay out of it entirely <laughs> because they're all grown ups and I don't need to be around at all, but it's still kind of hard for me. You know, I still kind of want to get in there and solve the problems for them. But um, I think when you have that intense of relationships and you're together that much, that some level of conflict is really inevitable. And when, when they were going through different stages where one kid would be harder to get along with or two kids just were like, you know, having trouble with each other. My solution to that is to give them more space, not to try to force it, but to give them more space from each other. Um, have, have one visiting friends much more often, let them do overnighters somewhere else and give the kid who's having problems with them a little more, you know, opportunity to get over it and relax and 
Um, also having friends over helps to change the dynamics. A lot of times they'd get caught up in some kind of conflict and then they'd kind of make up, but then that same conflict would just keep rearing its head. And having friends come over and change all the dynamics of how everybody's interacting would sometimes kind of break that cycle and then they'd be better off. And another thing is take one of the kids with you and go somewhere, um, you know, separate, separate them in a happy way, not separate them because you guys can't get along. So you have to be separated, but, you know, take one of the kids and, you know, we can't do this. We couldn't do this in those days, but these days you can say, you know, let's go to the grocery store, but stop at Starbucks or something and make it, make yeah, it a yeah. fun trip. <laughs> um, you know, those days it was like, stop it, stop and get an ice cream cone or something like that. Um, so that the kids could have breathing space from each other and and having more space even in your house helps a lot I think because if they have their own space they can retreat to that really just is theirs and that the other kids can't um, go in and and just interrupt them I think that can really really help you know I have I have two pretty outgoing extroverted kids and one very introverted and for her to have her own space was really critical in everybody getting along because she needed downtime way more than the other two did. So she needed to be able to get in there and, you know, relax and, and just be on her own sometimes for hours. Yeah. I found that to be a really uh, important thing here as well. I think we've got two out of three that are quite introverted and, just to be able to say, to say, you know, I've, this is enough, not even out loud, but just to realize for themselves, you know, this is kind of enough and have a place that they can go to uh, recoup themselves. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out, because I thought what you were sharing was great. Um, in I found the same thing um, when, when you don't, you don't know, you don't know how much support they might need. And, and, and it's different for each child too. You know, sometimes they want uh, lots of your support. Sometimes they prefer you to back off. Um, for me, the what helped the most really was was just looking to them to see uh, what their reactions were. Yep. You know, like like you said, some people may be needing one kind of advice and somebody else the opposite. Uh, it boils down to you know looking at your own child and yourself and figuring out. Um, what is working in the moment best for them and paying attention because that changes over time too, doesn't it? Yeah, no, it changes a lot. <laughs> and also like not, don't keep doing something that's not working, you know. Don't, working, yeah. Don't think that just, you know, you're not doing enough and doing and doing more. Try something completely different and, you know, try the opposite, for example, and see if that helps a little bit, you know, and if that helps a little bit, then do more of that. But if something's not working well, so, for example, there was a time period where I just aggravated all their conflicts. If as soon as, mm -hmm. and they would tell me that even, you know, they they yeah. would say like, "Mom, stay out of it." <laughs> so, two things there: yes, take their word for it, you know, and yeah. if it's not working, stop doing it and figure out some other alternative. And also, I guess the other one is to not think too much in terms of black and white. Like, there, it's not one thing or the other. It's try a little bit and see how it works and then try something else. But, you know, make, make small changes are okay. You know, just make a little change to how your reactions are, you know, and just make a little change to anything and see, watch them and see how that works, you know, see if that leads to, you know, anything slightly better. And then the other thing is like, don't get upset. I think the thing I did the worst at was it upset me when they were having conflict with each other. And that I was upset by it instead of just being accepting. And it's a matter of fact that when you have three kids growing up together, that they're going to have conflicts. I wasn't that accepting of it. I had some kind of an ideal in my head that they would all get along all the time. And so I, I, I got my own emotions, got connected to that, you know, got attached to the idea. And that's just yep. not realistic. And so if the parents can just stay calm and confident that even the kids might be screaming horrible things at each other, you know, because they're kids and or teens or whatever. And, you know, they they can say really awful things sometimes, you know, they don't have the same meaning to them that they do necessarily to us. And so a kid turns around and screams at another kid, you know, I wish you were dead. Totally freaks out the parents to hear that kind of thing. <laughs> but that's not the same for them. It's just an expression of the, I have these extreme strong emotions that I don't know what to do with. And I'm so angry and 
I'm trying to say the worst possible thing I can think of to say. And if the parents can hear that kind of thing without getting their own emotions caught up, then they can help them a lot more, <laughs> you know, help them raise the yeah. problems. But, you know, if you immediately react to that and start going, don't say that kind of thing, it's so awful, or, you know, like, get your own emotions involved, then you're part of the problem, too. So, you know, kind of yeah, some it, perspective, you know, remember their kids. You know? <laughs> so much wonderful food for thought in there. If you're struggling with sibling conflicts, I hope you found something helpful to play with. Try out a new perspective or a new approach and just see what happens. Okay, so let's move on to our next section, seeing learning in action. And we're going to start by playing with what we think learning looks like. I mean, we know what it's supposed to look like in school, and we probably have a good idea of what it looks like for us. None of that means we know what it will look like for our children. In episode 36, Lauren Seaver shared a great story about releasing her baggage around what learning looks like. When I think about it, like the first few months, um, I think my biggest concern was that our unschooling life didn't match the picture of what unschooling looked like in my mind. So I had these unschooling fantasies, uh, like what about what my own personal unschooling path would have looked like if I were unschooled as a child. <laughs> and I would, um, I'm one of those people who like throws themselves into whatever they're learning. So when I was a kid, I, I was into pioneer days and, you know, the mid 1800s and westward expansion. And when I was into that, that was my whole life. And so I, I had a pioneer dress with a bonnet I wore and I had the American girl doll and I read all the books and all the books I read were about the Oregon trail and, and the, that time period. And I played the Oregon trail video game and made food from that time period, all that. So I'm the type of person who throws myself into stuff and it becomes my entire life. So then River and I, you know, start this unschooling path and I was noticing, wow, like River doesn't learn exactly how I learn. <laughs> Think like that wouldn't be a big deal. But for whatever reason, I had envisioned something like when he was really interested in tornadoes and lightning, he did, didn't want to be thrown into a world of weather. And I could get all the books out from the library about weather. And he's like, I'm not looking at those. I don't care. And so <laughs> it was like a really big deal for me to learn like, oh, wait a second. Um, just because this is how I learn doesn't mean that's how he's going to learn. And just because I thought it was going to look this way doesn't mean that's what it's going to look like. And so um, I think just letting go of expectations um, was so huge um, for, for me to be able to really um, relish what was actually happening in our unschooling lives. So letting go of those shoulds and like just being there and actually witnessing what was happening was what helped me to see, oh my God, he's learning so much. And look at the way he does it. It's so fascinating, you know, and, and what he's interested in. And so that was big for me. So I don't know if it's as much fear as, as it is um, just like, you know, like a letting go of baggage. I think that's kind of like yeah. a, a key piece in my unschooling experience and in our <laughs> unschooling experience, me letting go of baggage. <laughs> When we come to unschooling, we definitely have a picture in our minds about what our days are going to look like. It's really helpful to realize that our utopian vision is not only unrealistic, but also only utopian to us. Our children are their own unique selves. And from there, it can take a while to release our baggage and begin to see things from our child's perspective, to recognize how much schoolish thinking is clouding our thoughts. In episode 89, Jan Hunt shares a funny yet telling story about how deeply school was woven into her thoughts and the value of instead choosing to trust both her son and herself. Oh, well, I have to laugh because I, it's just kind of a little funny story that I tell my clients when, when that topic comes up. Yeah. Um, one day when he was, well, I'm trying to think how old he was. He wasn't even two yet. Um, maybe 18 months. And he was in a corner of our living room, sitting on the floor playing with blocks. Mm -hmm. And recently he had, you know, he, he was very extremely verbal, I should add. I mean, he was just had a huge vocabulary by 18 months, um, which is fine. <laughs> you know, not necessary. I'm not bragging. I just, that's just Jason. Um, yep. uh, that was his, his, uh, 
his schedule. Everyone has their own schedule. Um, so he had this huge vocabulary, and so I was, and he had just um, been learning about colors, names of colors. So I was, I was, I, I got really smart. I said, "Oh, I'm going to ask him a, te- I'm going to give him a test question." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said um, he was playing with a, a, a red block, and I was really curious to know whether the word red was in his vocabulary yet. So, oh boy, I'll test him. <laughs> And so I said, so I pointed to it and I said, Jason, what's that? And he looked at it and he looked at me and he said, rectangle. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea that he knew that word. And I just remember saying to myself, okay, I guess I don't need to test him. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I can, I guess I can trust him to, you know, figure things out on his own. And I mean, I, I don't remember ever telling him that word, you know, probably got it from Sesame Street or something, but it was just, you know, just a lesson to me that I could, I could trust him. It was just funny. I mean, it's just a one little, a one little um, experience like that, but it, made a, it really had a big impact on me. I thought it just made me feel very silly and, and wrong, you know, and, um, and should have kind of showed me how school had gotten me into a testing, you know, that of course you have to test them. Of course you have to know what they're knowing and what they don't know. And, I still remember how freeing that early aha moment was for me, realizing that, of course, I don't need to test them. I'm hanging out with them all the time and seeing their learning in action. And eventually, as I continued to learn more about the nuances of unschooling, I moved beyond it being about my children's learning. I get to experience the wonder and joy of learning, too. Sandra Dodd explains this deeper level of unschooling beautifully in episode 71 about the changes in parents that unfold with unschooling. Well, I think becoming an unschooling parent is about recovery. And just like what you were just talking about, that it's different at different stages. They might be totally happy with a child who's elementary school age, but then when they become the age of whatever kind of school system they were in, mid-school, junior high, then the parents might get nervous again. and like, well, shouldn't you be doing this and this and this? It's like, well, based on what? Slow down. <laughs> shouldn't you be? So the parents, if they keep up with their own progress, they should be still learning about learning, either learning or trying to remember that they once knew long ago when they were little that learning can happen wordlessly from sound, from images, from touching and playing with things, and even with adults. There are some things that you don't learn by looking at, you know, sand toys or slime. You can't just look at it. You have to touch it and let it do what it does. Um, rocks and shells, they're no good to just look at. And by the way, if anybody has a rock or shell collection and you get bored, get a bowl of water. They look so different wet. The, the plainest little granite rocks can be beautiful when they're wet. But who's going to do that? It is not on the test, not even on the geology test. Uh, clay, uh, soap, oil, those things need to be touched and messed with to learn about them. And it doesn't hurt for adults to do that either. Different oils feel different ways. So looking away from book learning for a while and not only believing and understanding that learning can happen otherwise, but prove it, prove it by living with it and doing it. Instead of batting away questions and curiosities because you don't have to know, you're not in school, you're grown up, instead of batting them away, turn toward them. And just be still and wonder. You don't have to wait for your kids to ask a cool question. You might have your own cool questions then at that point. And sometimes you might share it with your kids, and maybe you don't. So I think this is another level of unschooling where at first the parents are so excited. They want to know everything the kids have learned, and they want to share with the kids everything they think of. And after a while, the kids can get crowded with that. And the parents can kind of go on automatic and get a little maybe monotonous. So if they get to the point where they can discover something fascinating, read about it, go look at it in person, look at a video about it or whatever, and then not tell their kids, that's kind of another plateau of unschooling where the flow of learning in the house is not just between parents and kids. But learning becomes part of the substance and the air of the way that family lives, and that's going to help again as the kids get older. So set the example of living as a learner. Unschooling becomes a lifestyle for the whole family, not something the kids are doing. We are living the idea of lifelong learning. 
I love how Sandra put it, learning becomes part of the air, like water is to fish, all-encompassing. Now let's move on to our next section, making our world bigger. So far on our journey, we've moved away from seeing parenting as a job and instead chosen to focus on our relationship with our child. We've moved away from control as a parenting tool and embraced connection, choosing to invest our time and energy in working through challenging moments with them. We've worked on releasing our baggage around our vision of what unschooling and learning should look like so we can see what's actually unfolding in front of us. And we've peeled back even more layers and embraced being a learner ourselves. Learning is deeply woven into the fabric of our days, adults and children alike. Unschooling has become our family's lifestyle. Now what? (laughs) Well, we're no longer focused on learning. We're focused on living. And how do we want to live? We now start to contemplate making our world bigger. This doesn't mean going out into the world more, unless, of course, that's what your family loves. It's more subtle than that. And in last week's episode, number 258, Anna shared this nugget of wisdom that fits beautifully right here. Learning the language of our children's lives. How that starts by joining them in their activities. And we have so much fun talking about how that can make our world bigger. And I think families starting out can get frustrated thinking, well, we don't have these connected relationships that you're talking about. And so often, I think this is the issue. You know, we're trying to connect on our level in the way we want it to go instead of truly being open and curious and going to them and learning about them and valuing what they love and seeing that spark and understanding why it's there. And when you're really listening, you learn the language of their lives, you know, whether it's related to games or books or hobbies or their passions. And so then you can ask real questions. You can follow up on things that you heard about. And that just shows them that you're interested. She remembered I was on this level. She remembered the name of this Comic-Con place that I wanted to go or this thing that really interests me or this World War III craft that I was talking about, you know, like these things excite someone when you realize that they've heard you. And so I think when we see that frustration from new families, definitely look at this, like, are you connecting in the way that makes sense to you, which is totally understandable, like that's what we know and that's what we do. But just this little switch, this little paradigm shift can make a huge difference in those connections with another person. Yes, yes. I, I love all the, those pieces that being able to go to them says that we see them for who they are, right? Like you said, and we value what they're choosing to do. So it becomes about the connection and less about us, right? right? right. And our perspective. It's and, and sometimes we can think, well, we're giving ourselves up to do this, but that's not it. We're making our world bigger. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. We're making our world bigger when we still hold our stuff and the things we like to do, but we're growing it by seeing the stuff that they love to do too. And seeing that that can all live side by side, all valuable, right? So it really is about making the world bigger when we go to them. And the other thing I I love, you mentioned um, seeing what lights them up and learning that language and the things that they're interested in. Because also that helps us bring more of those pieces into their lives as well. So not only are we validating for them that this has value, you know, because they're interested in that, like their world gets bigger too, when they see in our eyes and in our reactions that what they're interested in is valuable, right? Um, It just helps them feel much more seen and then they're sharing more with you and then you're learning so much more about them and then you can bring more things that you might not have thought about, you know, beforehand that they would be interested in, but when you see the bits that light them up about the thing, so it's not really, it may not really be just about the game, like, or whatever it is that that they're doing. It, it can be a deeper thing, like what aspects? There's so many different aspects to even a toy, right? You know, is it the color? Is it, how do they use it? How do they play with it? How do they engage? 
it, it, you know, are they, are they bringing humor to it? Are they creating art with it? Are they setting up tableaus with their stuffed animals? You know, are they telling stories with theirs? There's yeah. just so many things they're doing with anything that they're engaging with. So you're learning more about them when you see what bits light them up as they play with whatever it is. And like you said, that helps us expand their world because if it is the art that's attracting them, you might know a way to find some other art that's in a similar vein. And if it's the story, then it's like, oh, we could try this, or maybe you want to write your own story and I can help you with that or, you know, whatever it is. But when you have that true connection, when you're sitting back and really listening and hearing, then that's when the ideas can start flowing and you can bring, because I think so many times parents think, well, but I know more, I have a bigger view of the world or whatever. And of course, you and I have both seen that actually know <laughs> that you know, really lead the way. But when you're really listening and see them, you can bring your experience to that in a really authentic way that is well received because you're listening and you're hearing and you're understanding. Everyone wants to feel seen and heard, full stop. When we can meet our children where they are and steep in their joy and excitement as they follow their interests, they see that joy reflected back. They feel understood. They learn to trust themselves. In those feelings of safety and security, they are open to expanding their web of connections, to exploring more bits of the world. And why do we want to make our world bigger? Well, as Jeremy Stewart shares in episode 154, the tendency is for things to get narrower and narrower because it's comfortable there. I, I think, you know, as we as we sort of go through this journey of life, things tend to get narrower and narrower and narrower or, or they can. You know, like we're, we're forced into these little funnels. Yeah. And, and you know, to me, the, 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 the challenge is, uh, is to break that funnel down and actually get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and let more and more and more in. You know, let more of the world in, not less. You know, the more of the world you let in, the richer your life becomes. And, you know, and, and it's hard because, you know, we, we have all these messages. Oh, well, you're not supposed to do that or you're supposed to be doing this. or You know, so break down those barriers and, and, and include, even include that. Include all the messages that say you should be doing this. Allow those messages in and then question them. Brilliant. Right? <laughs> Yeah. So, no. so don't don't try to push them away. Yeah. Because I think that actually funnels you and gets you even more narrow minded. It does it's because like, you're trying okay, to ignore so society. You know, society or this person or my parents or whoever it is is saying, "Oh, your kids should go to school." Okay. Well, let's allow that in. Mm -hmm. You know, allow that allow that discontent in and and sit with that, and now just expand it, and and, and make your container bigger. Right. So that now you've got room for those things in there, too. And you keep making your container bigger and more stuff comes in and you make your container even bigger. You know, and I think that's the, the journey of unschooling is just allowing as much of the world in as possible and seeing what works and discarding what doesn't. But at least allowing it all to kind of percolate together in one big pot. <laughs> so good because you're building your view of the world. Right. And you learn so yeah. much more and you make make stronger connections that make more sense to you when you're when all the bits of the world are in there to consider rather than just having this narrow narrow focus and like back to when we were talking about the questions that you were asking for self-taught right it's like if you don't consider those if you feel like that's a failure and you're trying to avoid that you know mm -hmm. you're not you're, you're like you said, you're just narrowing your your experience, you're narrowing your view of the world. And not only does that do, not do yourself a service, because you're you're not learning, you're you're totally focused, but the energy that it takes, eventually to try and keep all that noise or all those other voices out, means you're going to have to do that forever. Whereas if you open up your world and you connect that and you figure out, you know, why they think that and you understand why they're, where they're coming from, you understand how that makes sense to them and you understand why it doesn't make sense for you, then, then right. you can live in the world with all of it, Right. Right. I mean, I think you said something really great there about, you know, um, the energy that it takes to resist and to, to push away these things that don't fit, you know, uh, or that are sort of encroaching upon our worldview or whatever. Uh, it takes so much energy that you end up robbing yourself of that creative spirit that we talked about, that igniting that spirit, you know, that we all have in us. Uh, and so it gets snuffed out. Yeah. And then you, your life is tiny, you know, because it's like, oh, well, I don't want to. 
push this away and push that away. It's like, no, no, invite all of it in. Just keep making the container bigger. Because, you know, we all have the potential for just vast amounts of, of um, compassion and empathy. And, you know, but we, we don't use it. You know, we, we want to separate ourselves or they're different from us or this is that, you know. And, and, and so we just become narrower and narrower and narrower. And I think it, we should be doing the opposite. You know, and that's what I love about unschooling is it kind of, in a sense, it sort of forces you to do that because there's no roadmap, as I said. You know, you're yeah. sort of winging it sometimes and learning to trust. And ultimately, the rewards are so much greater because as, as, you, as you begin to go through this process and you see that things miraculously work out, <laughs> you know, these kids turn out great. Yeah. Uh, they're amazing human beings. Like, how could that be? You know, it's like, it's mind blowing. What do you mean you never went to school and now, now you're doing like, you know, a PhD in biology? What? That makes yeah. no sense, but it does make sense. And so and when you really start to see that, oh yeah, that does make sense, then all of a sudden, you know, it becomes easier to kind of navigate that sense of unknowing or not, not knowing this, you know? I love Jeremy's insight that we all have the potential for vast amounts of compassion and empathy. That's been my experience as well. And his point that it's important to notice how, in trying to define ourselves, we are often pulled to separate ourselves, making our world smaller. With unschooling, we don't have a map, a well-trodden path to follow. Over time, we become, well, maybe not more comfortable, but more experienced with sitting in that space of not knowing. We don't need to run away from discomfort. Instead, we try things out and see what happens. We tweak things and try again. In episode 241, exploring race, racism, and diversity in unschooling, Erica Davis Petrie does a wonderful job of expanding on the idea of not running away from the discomfort of bigger societal problems. That doesn't mean we need to bring fear and unease into our children's lives. Instead, we can choose to make our world bigger and emotionally safe. Here's part of Erica's answer to a listener question about the idea of cultivating a safe unschooling nest and protecting our kids from scary news stories while wanting to actively work to dismantle white supremacy. I feel that you're not creating a a nest of peace, calm, joy, and tranquility if you ignore that these people are going to grow up. It's fine to think about a six-year-old as being six and being tender and delicate and, and needing to be protected, but it doesn't do anything for the 16-year-old if they're suddenly thrust into all of these dilemmas and they don't have the emotional, social, or even educational options to navigate that. And I think you do children a disservice when you pretend that they don't know what's going on around them. It's pretty hard, even in an all white suburban community, it's pretty hard to ignore what's going on in the larger world, unless you're completely detached from all media, from all technology, from all opportunity to hear people speaking of it. So it's not a matter of making your nest less safe and less um, stress-free. It's making your nest rich and full so that when things come, they have a context in which to handle them. I, I, I don't believe, because of my experience, I don't believe shielding children from the outside reality is actually safe for them and it's actually stress-free for them because they're very aware when people are tense. It's especially the youngest of kids, that all of their knowledge comes from exterior forces coming in. So it's not what you say, it's how you, it's how you move, it's how you act, it's how you react. And unless you're going to stay in your community, in your home, in, in your bubble, they're going to go out into the world and they're going to experience the shock of that stress and they won't have any context to put it in. So Rather than protect them from protests and things that are going on, I would include them in the conversation and do it in a way that you most understand it. So if you are are a reader of a certain magazine or a certain uh, watcher of a certain news program or you follow something online, 
find ways to include that experience in your conversation. I, I just read an article about um, a protest downtown. The people are protesting because they don't think it's fair that they're treated so badly when there's a police altercation. And I wonder if there's something I can do to help lessen the likelihood of harm. Now, that conversation doesn't bring any undue stress into the, into the nest, but what it does say to your, your little chicks, uh, I'm paying attention to what's going on in my world, and I want to offer solutions, and I want to, I want to make my nest grow. I, I want my safe place to be larger not smaller. So a lot of the, the unschooling circles that, that stress peace and harmony in the nest really don't unschool to me because my ideal of unschooling is making the world bigger, not smaller. My ideal is making my nest of safety and clarity larger. It's including the world, not excluding the world. So many great nuggets of insight in there. It's about making the world bigger, not smaller, about making your nest, your lives rich and full so that when things come, your children have a context in which to handle them. It makes so much sense, doesn't it? There's so much value in making our lives richer, our world bigger. And again, it doesn't need to be literally going out in the world when our kids would rather be at home. We can make our world bigger and understand our world better through conversations, through the things we watch and the things we read and the things we listen to. That way, when our kids do choose to step out into the world more, they aren't blindsided. And now to our last section, the question of college. For some families, first coming to unschooling, going to college isn't even a question. But soon enough, we're encouraged to really look at how we define success. Must college be an integral part of our children's lives, or can it really be a choice? I love a short and sweet comment on unschooling poster children that was shared by Ronnie Mayer in episode 130. People, especially who are new to unschooling, go looking for poster children. Mm -hmm. And I've talked about this in the past some. At any given moment, my kids could have been poster children for unschooling. I mean, there was that moment when both of my girls were at the University of Washington, you know, top flight public university, right? Yeah. And it's like, okay, there are my poster children for unschooling. By the following winter, yeah, by the following winter, they had both dropped out, mm -hmm. you know, different reasons, you know. Um, yeah. And then suddenly, so does that mean they're not poster children anymore? No, I think that means they're poster children even more. Yeah. You know, it's because they recognized something that wasn't right for them and they were able to move toward something that was more right for them. So much, yes. Being able to recognize when something isn't right and moving towards something else that is more right is such a valuable life skill. Now, another fear around unschooling in college is the idea of knowledge gaps. In episode 90, Phoebe Wall, a grown unschooler, shares her perspective. You know, to talk about gaps is to box yourself into a certain way of thinking about learning. Because um, I definitely have gaps in my knowledge. But like you said, I don't know anyone who doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, I resisted doing math pretty much my whole childhood. I had a lot of anxiety about it. I still have some amount of anxiety about it. Um, I built it up as this thing I was terrible at. And so I avoided even trying to do it. And I put up a wall. But you know, later on when I was in high school, because I went to high school part time, um, I decided on my own to take a math class. And I was like in the bottom tier, I was kind of embarrassed um, to be so far below my peers, but the drive was all my own. And so for the first time in my life, I was actually open to learning it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting now because I think a lot of my friends at the time who were in, you know, AP calculus, unless those people are in like a math or science field now, I honestly think probably our skill level has probably evened out. Like I kind of doubt that those people 
ended up retaining like yeah. massive amounts of information. Like, like maybe they would like be able to pick it up quicker than I would or something, but I don't know. I, I guess I feel like that's a gap for me, but also I don't necessarily think I'm that much worse off than anyone else who had to suffer through learning lots of things that were not applicable to their lives. And instead I was doing a lot of other things that were applicable to my life and spending a lot of hours, um, honing a lot of other skills. And then, also kind of developing that understanding um, that, you know, if you trust yourself, if you build up this confidence, you can learn anything, anytime, you know, upon demand. And it's all kind of based on like the context of like, why do I need to know this thing? And because I think I'm a very hands on learner. And so once something becomes concrete of like, I have to measure this piece of paper, because I am going to make it into a book, you know, mm-hmm. or I have to balance my books, because I run my own business, like, um, I am much more motivated to learn how to do things, you know, when they have a context. Phoebe chose to go to college, attending the Rhode Island School of Design. She explained that she chose to go to college to improve her work, not because it felt like some kind of obligation. She said she felt like her entire unschooled childhood was training for art school and then adulthood as an artist. Choice is the key. And speaking of the value of choice around going to college, in episode 141, Alex Trossett shared his experience. He left school in grade three and began unschooling, including through the teen years. He worked for a few years and then at age 22, decided he wanted to go to college and pursue engineering. So the the biggest transitions were definitely starting college, getting my math caught up, which I want to stress anybody can do. Like if you go to high school and you learn all the math and then you decide to take a five-year break. If you don't, didn't do any math in that five years, you, you would start in developmental math just as I was going to had I not done any, you know, it's something I see all the time now as a tutor of two years. Um, and also um, if no matter what situation you're in, you can go and you can catch up. Like there's no, there's no reason you can't learn what was taught in high school faster and more efficiently for yourself because you can cater to your own learning style. You can cater to, you know, your schedule and you're also catering to your own interests. You're doing it because you have a goal you want to accomplish. You can do it so much more efficiently and you're going to retain it better than somebody who's learning it because they're told they have to learn it. Alec hadn't done any formal math since he left school in grade three. He knew he could just start by taking the developmental math class, but he decided to see if he could test out of that. He chose to spend about four hours a day working his way through math videos online at Khan Academy. And after about two months, he wrote the placement test, passed, and was able to start in the pre-calculus class. And it turns out he fell in love with math, changed his major, and is now in grad school working toward his doctorate in math. He shared lots of details about his journey if you want to check out our conversation. At college age, comparing schooled and unschooled kids' knowledge is comparing apples and oranges. While schooled kids have learned the standardized curriculum, unschooled kids have had their unique life experience and they've grown their own web of knowledge. What's so valuable to realize is that unschooling teens haven't been doing nothing while their high school counterparts were busy with classes. They were busy learning other things, things that mattered to them. Just because they weren't things that could be used to check off these particular math boxes doesn't mean it was time wasted. With a lifelong view of learning, there is no ahead or behind. There is stuff you know and stuff you want to learn, regardless of age. When Alec wanted to learn math, he did. And as he explained, he did it so much more efficiently because it was something he wanted to do. His choice and the resulting intrinsic motivation was the key. If they're interested in college at whatever age, they'll start learning that stuff. Maybe they prep on their own. Maybe they take remedial classes. They're only remedial based on a conventional school kid timetable. We are not unschooling to specifically get the school body of knowledge. Katie Patterson is another grown unschooler who spent her teen years deeply involved in other things that mattered to her. 
Her mom, Sue Patterson, and I talked about the teen years in episode 166, and here's how she described Katie's experience when she chose to go to college. And so one of the things that Katie said when she went and she did what she considered really poorly on the placement exams, because this was a kid that really spent, a, I mean, she had jobs, so she was making money and out in the world, but she also spent a lot of time on acting and dance and voice and um, theater. And so she was doing nothing as far as that kind of prep that people would do for for college. And so when she went to take the placement exam, she didn't score that well. And at first she was like, really felt bad. And, and, you know, I was trying to figure out, okay, I don't know how to handle this, you know? And so we went back the next year and the counselor said, you know, you can just take the classes. You don't even have to retake the test. And so she said, well, then that's what I'll do. And she did. And she said, mom, I traded three semesters of developmental classes for 12 years of school. And I sat in a classroom filled with people who never got to be in a theater production because they were so busy in school. And there they are sitting in the place in the same place that I'm sitting. There is no behind. There are apples and oranges. There is no value in comparison. There are choices and a lifetime to explore and learn new things. College can be a real choice. Some unschooled kids choose to go and some choose other paths. They are all equally valid and worthwhile. So here we are. I hope you found this episode helpful or at least interesting. I've really enjoyed spending five years engaging in conversations with so many wonderful unschooling parents and grown unschoolers. I am so grateful to them for sharing their stories, their experiences, and their sparkling nuggets of wisdom about unschooling and their unique unschooling journeys. I want to leave you with one last snippet. Adrian Peace Williams is a grown unschooler, and in episode 163, she shared what she values most about growing up unschooling. Have a listen. And... Have a wonderful week living and learning with your family. But I, I think what I came to is like the things that I have valued, I think the most from my experiences being unschooled was that, um, was like my tools kind of that I have now. I, that I think being an unschooler got me and the parents that I have was like, okay, how do I listen and how do I communicate my needs and how do I listen to other people's needs and how do I know how to ask questions when I don't know the answers and and how do I go into a new situation feeling okay and feeling like, okay, I can do this. And even if I don't know how to do it, I know what my next steps are or how to figure it out or, okay, this didn't work. Where do I go from here? And how to like how to live and how to, how to love too, like how to love myself and how to love other people and how to, you know, figure my way around a city and like how to take care of other kids or like how to have a conversation with an adult when I'm three (laughs) (laughs) or like, I think knowing how to learn is much more important than knowing math or like knowing how to write an essay perfectly because if you know how to learn then you can go into most any situation and figure it out and know how to have the confidence that that's okay like like teach your kid that it's okay to not know something it's okay to you know be wrong or like make mistakes and it's okay to do these things and that's those are the situations where you learn because if you know how to learn and if you know how to fail, then like you can do anything, I think, (laughs) because if it's okay to keep failing, eventually you're going to get it and you're going to learn. I hope you found this episode helpful on your unschooling journey and be sure to check out the wonderful archive of earlier podcast episodes. The conversations never go out of date. 
And you can find more information about my books, my Patreon community, and the Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summit at my website, livingjoyfully.ca. Have a great day.